Welcome to the Addiction Connection Podcast, connecting the hope of the gospel with the heart of addiction. Today's topic is cross-talking. I wrote a book called Cross-Talking, and I'm uh, excited to say that it's really one of my favorite books that I've ever written. I, uh, I talk about the word, I named it the word cross-talking because in AA circles, you're, you're not in self-help meetings and recovery meetings. Cross-talking is not allowed, and, and probably for good reason. I, I, don't, uh, I don't disagree with that at all. But cross-talking at the meetings is defined as a dialogue between two individuals that excludes all others. Well, that's not what you want in a group setting. So you don't want cross-talking where this guy over here talks to that guy over there and they leave out the rest of us who are sitting in the group, right? So that's the idea. It inhibits open sharing and freedom to express opinions. But here's another little thing that's not allowed at a lot of AA meetings is cross-talking, and that's a capital C cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. So that's denied because you can talk about a higher power and any higher power would do, and it, just in a generic way, but the Lord Jesus Christ is a one higher power that when you say that he's exclusive, he's it, then he's the only higher power. In fact, he's the highest power and the only real, true God. Well, if you say that, then now you're going against the AA way. The spiritual program allows any higher power to be a higher power. And so... Um, that's why I named it cross-talking, because I disagree with that second aspect of cross-talking. I agree with the, the idea that two people shouldn't be cross-talking and excluding everyone else. I, I agree there. But I disagree in that we can't talk about the one true God, because that's the, the, the truth of the matter. He is the one true God. And if people don't understand that, they're going to die and go to hell. So these meetings that are spiritual actually point people away from Christ. They don't, they don't say that they do. If you ask somebody, they'll say, oh, no, no, you can talk about God. Well, you can, but once you start saying he's the only way to God, the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me is what Jesus said about himself. Once you start saying that about him in those meetings, you are now out of line. You're out of line at those meetings. Well, I I have a problem with that, and I think you should, as a pastor or church leader or counselor, you should have a problem with that too. And then you look at AA, and it's not all that successful anyway. So I don't know why we defend it and promote it in the church world. It, it's not all that except uh, uh, fantastic and effective anyway. But I picked up cross talking. And um, I'm Mark Shaw, by the way, and this is the Addiction Connection Podcast, Connecting the Hope of the Gospel, the Heart of Addiction. I picked up the book Crosstalking. I really love this book. It's sub subtitles, uh, Daily Gospel for Transforming Addicts. And uh, I wrote 45 daily devotions. I picked day 27 here. And it's called The Lord Examines the Heart. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and of spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That's from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. And it's interesting that this word of God that we read, it's alive, it's living, God says. God says about his own word, it's alive. Well, how could a book with words in it be alive? That sounds like um, personification. It sounds like something that just um, cannot be true. Well, here's how it's true. It's the Holy Spirit that enlivens the word in our hearts. And then it says it's active. The word of God is active, sharper than any two-edged sword. A two-edged sword pierces going in and going out. And it pierces to the division of soul and of spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So that's what God's word does. That's where you need to start if you're if you're trying to change something in your life. You want to go to the God's to the Word of God and say, How, what does God say about this? 
And then how must I change? And that's the layout that you see in 2 Timothy 3.16 with do- doctrine, reproof, correction, and discipline training in righteousness, those four elements of 2 Timothy 3.16. So reproof is the second part of that. After you hear read doctrine, then you recognize, wow, I need to change. I need to reprove. I need to correct something that I'm doing wrong based on the word of God. And then it's the same, really same layout in Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. You start with Jesus, who is the truth, the word of God. Same thing as doctrine. And then you put off So you're reproved and you're thinking, oh man, there's something I need to get out of my life and and take out of my life. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's excessive drinking. I need to, the Bible says, do not be drunk with wine for that is debauchery, Ephesians 5.18. So that's the truth. I drink excessively. That's the, the thing that I'm doing. I need to be reproved about that and put that off. I need to stop drinking. And then verse 23 in Ephesians 4 says to be renewed in the in the spirit of your mind. So your your attitude towards alcohol has to be I cannot drink because and I like abstinence personally. I, I encourage abstinence because I think people need a season of abstinence. That's why I, I talk about swearing a Nazarite vow, taking a Nazarite vow in um the one of the last chapters of the Heart of Addiction book because I want people to take a period of time where they don't drink and where it forces them to then put their eyes where they need to be, which is on Jesus. They need to look to heaven. And so the Nazarite vow is just one way to to characterize that. That's in number six. You can read about that. It's interesting. I I might do a podcast on that. I've talked about it a little bit before, but it's just so interesting to me how, how, um, how that lays out in scripture in the old Testament. Uh, And John the Baptist probably was a Nazarite and took that Nazarite vow. But anyway, <clears throat> I digress. Um, our, our passage here in Hebrews 4 is telling us about the discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And, and, and that's what God's word does. So when we look at doctrine, reproof, or the put off in Ephesians 4, 20 through 24, and then the renewing of the mind, that's the Holy Spirit changing my view and having me hate what I once loved, drinking alcohol to excess. I once loved that, so now I've got to hate that. Uh, But I love now be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what it says in Ephesians uh, Ephesians 5.18, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So don't be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled by the Holy Spirit. So the, the point here is I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and that's a renewal of the mind. I, I need to hate drinking alcohol to excess. I need to love being filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you get filled with the Holy Spirit? You read God's Word. You meditate on God's Word. And then you live God's Word out. You don't just read it in a book. You do it. You, you live an obedient lifestyle that honors God and that shows that His Word is true. We demonstrate it. I love thinking about that. God's called us to demonstrate that his word is true. He wants us to show people God's word is true, and this is how it's true um, when we live it out in, in, uh, in everyday life. And then the last part of that Ephesians 4 passage, verses 20 through 24, is the put on. That's the righteous, holy thing that we can do, the expression of God's word, God's truth, this renewed mind that we're renewed in the spirit of our minds. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 would call that the correction step. And then discipline, training, and righteousness is the expression of all of that that's happened in our hearts. So our passage in Hebrews 4 is so true. God discerns those thoughts and intentions of the heart. He helps us to see what are we thinking about and what are we wanting is it lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life? What am I seeking after? And then it says a very sobering statement in Hebrews 4, 13, and no creature is hidden from God's sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I mean, God sees everything, he knows everything, and we're going to give him an account. That That's a scary statement. 
You can't just run around saying, I'm free in Christ, I can do whatever I want. No, no, no. You're going to give an account to God, and I'm going to give an account to God. And he sees everything. Nothing is hidden from him. I remember counseling two guys at the same time with uh, drinking issues, drinking to excess. And one guy would think, well, I can, I can drink and go behind this rock and drink, and God doesn't know, nobody knows. I mean, he really thought... He could hide from God. That that's kind of a, a simple explanation, just to to sh- to share that with you. And the other guy drank, and he knew God saw him wherever and whatever he did, and he had a presence of God awareness that he knew God was watching. God was there, and I love that about him. And guess who stayed sober longer? Guy number two who had awareness of God, the presence of God was was always with him. He had a relationship with God. The other guy didn't know God. He was more like Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, hiding in the trees and bushes away from God, uh, not not even thinking that God knew where he was. And, and of course, God called out to this guy, where are you? Just like he did to Adam and, and is still calling that guy to this day. In this cross-talking book on day 27, it's, it's a, just one of the days I picked out really at random. I just think about the importance of this relationship with God, this heart-level relationship, because he knows our thoughts. He searches the heart. He knows our motives and our passions. I would argue that just about everything we do in the flesh um, has a shred of selfishness in it. Now, some people do really nice things. They donate to charities, but they do so because of a fleshly motive. There's a shred of, of flesh in it. You might say, well, there's only 1%. Okay, you know, I know famous celebrities who are not born-again believers who give tons of money to charity. Why are they doing that? That's a good thing. But there's a shred of selfishness there in their flesh, in their choice to do that, that very thing. The only way we do something that's not got a percentage of our flesh in it, not 1%, not any, is when it's the Holy Spirit working through us and that God gets all the glory. I mean, that's it. That's the only time there's not a shred of selfishness in our actions that are motivated by our flesh. It's when it's motivated by the Spirit of God to will and to work for his good pleasure, as Philippians 2, 12 and 13 tells us. And God holds us accountable for our thoughts and our motives and our desires in the heart. So it'd be one thing to say, well, once you took that first drink, then it was sin. You know what? God says it was sin when you desired the drink in the first place. Look at Matthew 5, 28. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is teaching that you say it's the outward thing, the adulterous act. I say it's when you look at a woman with lustful intent that you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. So it's the heart level. And here's what's scary. God knows our hearts. He already knows. So we need to confess our thoughts to him and ask for his forgiveness constantly throughout the day. And you'd say, oh, Mark, that's too much. No, there are often times we do things out of a selfish heart. And we have to learn to be giving and selfless, just like Christ Jesus was when he walked the earth. He's our model, and we're becoming like him. So we replace those selfish thoughts with godly thoughts of righteousness that come from God's word. And we remember that his word will help us to become more godly and Christ-like. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God's saying, I think differently. I see it differently, a different perspective, and you need to adopt my ways of thinking, my ways of acting, my my <clears throat> words, not your words or man's words. You need to start with me. 
Start with God. Start with Scripture. And then renew your mind by His Spirit and His Word. We need to think more like Him. We need to talk more like Him. We need to act more like Him. And we need to have desires that are like Jesus. Our lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life in the flesh only serve self. But they can be redeemed by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of God. God can redeem those things to where we begin to uh, desire pleasure in such a way that it's tied and connected to God and it glorifies him. God's not a, a God who doesn't want us to experience pleasure. God's not a God who doesn't want us to, uh, to have possessions. Uh, God wants us to possess things. He just wants us to connect it to him. So the lust of the eyes can actually be redeemed just like the lust of the flesh. The pleasure can be redeemed and connected to Christ, just like pride of life. That desire for excellence and doing things well, but for your own glory, that's where it's sinful. God can redeem it by his spirit and motivate us to then do things that glorify him that are excellent and well done, um, that please him and glorify him and point to him and are connected to him. So only God can do that. <clears throat> and it's just powerful for me to, to think about. So I wanted to highlight day 27 in the Crosstalking book simply because I think it's a great message and a great way to encourage you that uh, God is concerned about your heart and then it's really just, it's not 12 steps, it's one step. Confess your sin, repent to God, place your faith and trust in Jesus. Okay, maybe that's three steps. <laughs> Confess your sin, Lord, I'm a sinner. And then repent, please forgive me as I, as I trust in you. I can't fix this myself, Lord. You have to fix this in my heart. You have to create the willingness and the desire in me for new desires, new desires that glorify God. And that's repentance. And I hate my sin, and I love you, Lord, so I want to do that. Help me to do that. I can't do it in my flesh. And then the final part of that is that's that change of mind, that metanoia. Then the final part of that is then placing our faith in Christ. Lord, you can, and I trust you to do that. And then you begin to walk out your life. You walk it out by being in the Spirit and living in the Spirit. I love Galatians 5. At the end of the, the chapter there of 5, we, if we live by the Spirit, we'll walk in the Spirit. And so God wants you to have these new desires that come from His Spirit so that you can walk out your life in a way that pleases Him. And the addicted person can do this. Uh, these three steps, if you want to call it that, Confession, repentance, and faith in Christ. That's what's required. I know they want 12 steps, but the Bible has better news. It's three steps. Well, I'm really grateful for you uh, listening to our podcast, and thanks for your prayer support for the Addiction Connection. We have an exciting year planned. I'll talk more about that in future podcasts, uh, some neat announcements that are coming out here very, very soon as our team works on some behind the scenes projects that we don't want to talk about too early, but uh, we're hoping for an April release date for this big one. And, uh, and I'm excited. You ACBC people should be excited about it too. That's just a little hint. Wink, wink. All right. Well, thanks for joining me on the podcast today, the Addiction Connection podcast, connecting the hope of the gospel with a heart of addiction. Thanks for joining me. My name is Mark Shaw, and I am a humble servant of the Most High God who has the best, best, best word of truth and the, the power of the Holy Spirit to help you and I with all difficulties in life, whether it's suffering or whether it's sin, we can turn to him and trust him by faith uh, to do his work for his glory and for our good. Thank you and God bless. Yeah.